Today on the We Invested podcast, we have Emmanuel Daniel, and he is an award-winning global thought leader in the future of finance, the founder of The Asian Banker, and the author of The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance is here. Emmanuel, how are you doing today? Firstly, I'm doing fine. Thank you very much for having me on your program. Uh, you've got a um, uh, you know, wide um, re- uh, audience, and uh, I hope that I live up to the expectation of the, the followers that you have. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I mean, and it's a huge honor to have you on the show and on the program and to just get the chance to talk to you and and learn more about your rich history and, and what you plan to do in the future as well. So, you know, before we get started, would you mind just letting the people know how they can find you on the Internet or your website or uh, social media? Well, uh, it's very simple. Uh, just look me up on EmmanuelDaniel.com uh, and then everything leads from there. So, um, that's supposed to be my blog page, but it also leads to my um, to to my book and 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 to the companies that I have built over time. Uh, so the the most important of the companies that I've built is called the Asian Banker, uh, and that's a twenty eight year history. Wow, that's incredible! And uh, you know, let's just kind of start from the top and talk a little bit about you know where you're from and where you grew up. Okay, I come from Southeast Asia, uh, and and uh, a lot of the work that I've done until recently. Uh, was in East Asia. So um, all of Southeast Asia, and if you've heard the country called Singapore, which is a small little dot, an island just about twice or three times the size of Manhattan, 5 million people, um, but, um, you know, which has got its act together, pretty good, um, you know, technologically driven and all that. And then since 2000, I've been spending a lot of time in China. And, um, and there I was able to see the miracle that was China. Uh, a lot of it had to do with China becoming a signatory to the World Trade Organization uh, in 2001. So I was there just before that started. And it was been, it's been a 22 year history of having a front seat view of a country that um, you, know, um, you know just made uh, the most of what it had uh, in that period of time. And of course, today, um, you know, there are issues, uh, you know, both within China and in China's relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, and I think that when you have a, um, a front seat view of what's going on and then you keep yourself honest with yourself as to what it all means, um, you're able to interpret it a lot more deeper. Um, you know, I've visited now, I've done about 100 and eight countries, something like that. Uh, and, and, and now after I've done 100 countries, I said to myself, you know what, let's just finish the other 95. But it's, it's not a, a goal in itself. But what it does to me is uh, to start looking at uh, comparative, um, you know, developments between different countries, uh, and the essence of what the US is about, the essence of what China or any other country is about. Uh, it's always very good to see countries, uh, you know, developing, making the most out of themselves. But we all have to be mindful of our feet of clay. Uh, so China has its feet of clay. It's a huge country of, you know, the biggest country in the world where uh, existing governance structures are not good enough to hold it together. So they needed to be a little bit more draconian uh, and they pay a price for that. So there are things that they can do very well and there are things that they will not ever do very well. Uh, and then I... And I've been, you know, traveling to the U.S. a lot, but this year I've been a lot in the U.S. more than any other country. Um, and re- relating back to the U.S., especially after two years of absence, uh, you know, after the uh, COVID uh, crisis, um, you know, it refreshes um, what I thought the U.S. was about. Um, you know, and actually, you know, if you live in the U.S. today, you 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 would feel. Um, you, you would feel that like there's a lot of angst in the country. But when you come back from having not been around for a while, uh, you appreciate uh, some of the essence of what the U.S. is, which is it's a country built from the ground up. Uh, it's a country of many uh, local communities uh, all deciding to you know, form um, a, a shared union. Uh, you know, whereas China is more the top down approach, which is, you know, the center holds everything else together. So so this uh, comparative cultures, comparative developments is something that um, I've had the privilege of seeing uh, many different countries, how they evolve. And uh, I've applied it mostly in banking uh, because I need to run a business and, and grow it. Uh, so over time, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've, I can walk into almost any country in the world including the U.S., and you mentioned just now Wells Fargo. 
uh, Dick Kovacevic, uh, the former chairman, the chairman who actually created Wells Fargo by amalgamating it with other institutions, uh, Northwest, I think at that time, um, you know, uh, the bill, the institution that he built, um, you know, to to understand it directly from him. And then when things go wrong, you, you know where they go wrong and stuff like that. Uh, and the reason I took an interest in banking, I, I, I qualified as a lawyer. And uh, as soon as I qualified, uh, for some weird reason, I just, that's the last thing I wanted to be, a lawyer. Uh, and then I went into consulting and so on. Uh, and banking sort of eventually caught my attention because in my part of the world, um, if you start a publication which is, uh, you know, related to politics and so on, you're going to spend, you know, half your life in jail or something like that. You know, you get called up for having a different opinion and all that. But, but if you do banking, it's a, I call it the cathedral industry. Uh, regardless of which society you live in, uh, you'll always have something to do with banking from the day you're born to the day you die. Uh, and banking holds entire countries together. And when I land into any, any country, I get to meet the, the top people in finance. So that's the story of how I evolved, um, you know, what uh, my, the focuses that I have in, in my professional and personal life. Um, and, and then within the banking industry, I've watched how uh, banking has always been talking about innovation from the days of the ATM. The ATM was an original innovation. And uh, the people in banking would say, oh, you know, you don't, we now have 24 hour service. You, you can do your banking even if the branch is closed. And then later they closed the branch because they wanted uh, people to do more business uh, on, you know, on the telephone and then, and then today on the internet and so on. So I've seen that evolution. And today is the most amazing of evolutions, which is that uh, because of blockchain technology, because of the network effect, um, of uh, the platform economy, um, you know, entire business models are changing. So I'm actually watching how banking and finance is changing and how that has a knock-on effect uh, to the rest of society. So I think that in a nutshell is uh, my intellectual and emotional and uh, personal journey. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, you have a very rich history, as I mentioned a little bit earlier before we started recording. I mean, and just so much knowledge so much wisdom in in the industry of banking and even just worldly um knowledge and wisdom by traveling to 108 different countries and and meeting with different financial leaders in each of the countries which is you know something that i want to ask you about and kind of get your opinion on you know by you have um by you being able to travel to 108 different countries how has that impacted your outlook on life and success like what insights have you gained from being able to travel to those different countries and you know i guess one more question in this you mentioned that um you mentioned that you know you're able to compare the different countries have you ever been able to recognize any similarities within these countries as well so you know like for example um um i would put um a few countries together like if i put ghana Rwanda, uh, Ghana in Af West Africa, and then Rwanda in East Africa, Indonesia and China uh, into the same uh, category. Uh, what is the common um, theme? Uh, and the thing is this, that uh, all of these countries today are successful in their own way. I mean, Ghana is going through an economic problem at the moment, but uh, its political structure is um, you know, very stable today. Um, and then um, Rwanda, had a genocide uh, in 1994, uh, you know, and um, 800,000 people. And today they call it the Singapore of Africa. Um, you know, when, when you cross the streets uh, where there is, uh, you know, a, a pedestrian walkway, cars actually stop and, you know, and there's trees from the airport to your hotel. What happened? You know, and then Indonesia, which if you remember during the Asian financial crisis, uh, was the basket case of the world because um, you know the president had to um, had to you know had to bow down to the chairman of the IMF to borrow money from him and stuff like that and then China which has had its uh, cultural revolution and then um, then I asked myself um, what made the difference in these countries what, what was the what was the thing that makes them change uh, and change dramatically um, and the answer that I I sort of pops up in your head when you're a traveler is that because they've seen the alternative, because they've seen the alternative, you know? And so this year in, in the US, when the January 6th incident happened, I said, 
you know what, they're not going to go back there because they've seen the alternative. Um, you know, so sometimes uh, really bad things have to happen in a country. Uh, and then an entire population says to itself that, you know, that this is, we won't go back there because we've seen the alternative. Um, you know, so that's one theme that, um, that comes from just getting, uh, you know, a pedestrian view of different countries, just turning up and, and getting a sense of the, of things that happen in a country. And then today, um, you know, in China, there's incredible lockdowns right now. Um, and, and, um, and then you ask yourself, why would a government do that? You know, like, why would they lock down entire cities, um, you know, and, and, um, and, and, you know, um, put control, I mean, demonstrate control over its population. And there I came up with another, you know, simple phrase, okay, um, because they can, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, you know, governments do what they do in many different countries because they can, you know, and it's actually the same because they can as to why the U.S. response to 9-11 was to go out to um, to Iraq and to Afghanistan and bomb the hell out of them, okay? Because they can, uh, you know. It's the same because they can, um, meaning that um, you know there are certain skills and there are certain uh, abilities that uh, states uh, build within themselves, and it become they perfect the process. Uh, and then when there's a crisis or a need to respond to challenges, they go back to the core skills that they have. So if China didn't have the ability to organize as it does today, uh, it wouldn't have taken this route of uh, looking at, um, you know, of, um, of locking down entire cities. Uh, you know, it would have tried some other way. Uh, it would have, you know, tried a medical way or something like that to try and solve that problem. So, so we, uh, when trying to understand countries and, and understand uh, governments and, and states, uh, I look for the essence of what makes that country tick. And it always comes from things that they've practiced over the years. Uh, they get very good at it. And then whenever there's a real problem, uh, they use that skill because they can, you know, because they, that's the skill that they have. Um, so these are two examples of, um, of um, you know, um, perceptions or insights that I sort of capture um, just by traveling. And, and I enjoy that because um, actually a lot of, um, you know, this thing called, um, geopolitics uh, is, is uh, built from the ground up. Uh, countries do what they do, not because they are grandstanding and claiming that they're good against each other, but because of the substance of what they are inherently. And understanding the substance can even help me guess where they're taking it, where they're going to be taking it, uh, you know, where the next inflection point might be and stuff like that. And that's actually the, the title of my next book, which is The Winning Civilization. Uh, where I'll be uh, discussing some of the points that I've just raised with you. Absolutely. I mean, and that's incredible. And these are incredible worldviews that you have and, and that you're sharing with us today. So I'm definitely appreciative of that. Um, you know, and something interesting that you mentioned as well was you've seen the evolution of banking and finance through blockchain. Um, you know, and, and blockchain just gives people the, the ability to... Uh, as you put it, individualize, it individualizes personal finance. So before we kind of dive into that, I want to ask, what are your thoughts or your feelings towards that? Because you've seen banking come from, you know, where where they have these huge brick and mortar buildings to now there are some banks that exist and don't even have a brick and mortar presence. They're just only online banks or or these um, crypto uh, exchanges don't have a physical presence, but they're online. So what are your thoughts about the evolution of, of finance. Actually, the title of my book is The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance is Here. Um, you know, and another subtitle in order to describe the book a little bit better is that we are moving from the platform economy to the personalization economy. Uh, when I showed the draft of my book to the people in Google um, and, you know, and Microsoft and so on, um, you know, surprisingly, uh, some of them pushed back on the book because uh, they can't accept a world uh, where the platform economy as we know it today will start to dismantle, to disintegrate, okay? Now, the, 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 the thing about my book is that um, it's not any one thing, um, you know, uh, it's actually uh, an amalgamation of a few ideas put together 
Um, so so I, there are a few themes that, that run in the book. So one of the themes is from platforms to, to, uh, to personalization. Now the banking industry itself, uh, we need to separate uh, the industrialization of finance uh, with the personalization of finance. When a bank wants to do something better, faster, and do more of it, uh, that's industrialization of finance. So when a bank says that if we have branches, uh, we can onboard uh, you know, 10,000 customers a month. Uh, but if you do it digital, we get 60,000 customers a month and it's all um, you know, virtual. Now that's not um, that's not um, revolutionizing finance. That's industrializing it even more, um, you know, to, to have a, a better, cheaper way of doing the same thing. Now, uh, the, 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 the challenge that is, that is confronting finance today uh, is that there is a whole new dimension of technology uh, that didn't exist before, okay? Um, now, when banks went on the platform, they wanted to do what, the Amazons and the, and the Googles of the world were able to do, which is onboard a lot of customers and then monetize them. Uh, they used phrases such as uh, reaching the unbanked, um, you know, uh, making finance more inclusive. Uh, they were very um, tricky phases, fr phrases because um, it, made, it gave the impression that banks were cared for society. Uh, but actually what they were doing was trying to onboard even more customers than they always had. Uh, and then eventually uh, monetize them. And, and uh, new technology players that wanted to provide finance were also doing the same thing, which was, you know, they would say, oh, this is about financial inclusion. Look at how many people don't have bank accounts, you know. Now, the transition that is taking place is that people going forward do not even need bank accounts. You know, they, they you know, like stop to think about it. Since when was having a bank account a desirable thing because um, you know bank account is static, uh, is historical. Uh, you know it doesn't connect to anything else that you do, uh, and and the relationship is with a bank. Uh, and today, because of digital wallets of all kinds, okay, whether it's digital wallet of, of traditional fiat currency or, or cryptocurrencies, um, you can become part of a community. You decide who you want to interface with, uh, and money becomes a token with which you create others' relationships. Uh, you know, and, and the big thing in finance is this, nobody ever really needed a mortgage. Nobody ever really needed a, a, a deposit account. Uh, people wanted to have houses. They wanted to have, you know, brand new spanking houses and they needed it to be financed. But you can't put a mortgage into a, um, you know, a, into a box and pretty up the box and, and give it as a gift. Uh, the gift you can give is a house, right? So, so finance is always be meant to be a means to an end. Um, and finally, we've come to a point where um, finance can play that role where you don't need the institution to be the intermediary between you, your money, and who you want to give it to, okay? So that um, business model today exists. Um, it's just that uh, a number of uh, elements need to be put in place for it to function correctly. Uh, and as I say in my book, uh, we need to get things like identity right. Uh, non-repudiation right, uh, risk profile. That means that if I want to give you money directly, I should be able to know something about you, uh, which comes from the network effect. It doesn't come from a credit bureau like Fair Isaac uh, or so, uh, something like that, and uh, or the bank itself, but but it can come from the, the people that you interact with and I interact with. Uh, okay, so all these elements are now just taking place. Um, and when you look at... Um, some of the frontier people uh, in uh, decentralized finance, as they call it, as opposed to centralized finance. Centralized finance is where the bank centralizes the relationship and, and it has to exist in the middle of the transaction in order for it to be completed. Uh, in decentralized means that uh, there's no center. You, you, I can relate with anybody I want to. Um, and the thing is that uh, because of decentralized finance, you, you have bad actors like... Um, um, you know, um, Sam uh, Bankman fried uh, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, the guy who did all the, uh, the cryptocurrency problems that we've had recently. Um, now, the thing is that uh, that new transition uh, needs to be curated somewhat uh, in order that uh, bad actors, um, you know, don't define it. Um, some of the problems that 
exist in decentralized finance also exist in um, you know centralized finance. Um, you know uh, there you know we've had uh, you know the Ponzi schemes and so on uh, in in uh, regulated finance, uh, and and they exist today in uh, unregulated finance. Um, so that transition needs to be made. Um, now then the question is. Um, is that transition real? Uh, will you know, and and how will it play out? So I'm telling the uh, people in the platform industry, the the Googles and the Amazons of the world, that their industry is going through a transition where uh, they will increasingly find it difficult uh, to um, to control relationships in the way that they have been able to in the first twenty years of the platform economy. Uh, in fact, this is the year that um, Facebook has started to um, lose customers. I mean, it's total number, customers, total number of customers is in decline this year. Uh, and the common thinking is that it's uh, losing customers to TikTok. Now, what is Facebook? It started as a social media on a desktop. And that was in 1996, 97, 98, right? So in, in that period, by the time we reached 2000, uh, the the uh, social media uh, ecosystem started operating out of a mobile device. Uh, 2010, it started operating on a mobile device. And Facebook almost lost the plot in 2010. Okay, And that's why when you go to China, you will see that there are Facebook equivalents that operate so much more um, um, you know, as a real ecosystem. Uh, in the U.S. today, there's a lot of discussion that, oh, maybe uh, micro apps do not work in the U.S. Um, you know, you, you can't have a super app uh, platform and stuff like that. Um, and that's not because it was not possible. It's because the original players didn't make that transition into super apps. Um, you know, and today when, when you see what, um, um, you know, uh, what... Uh, um, uh, Tesla, uh, my, uh, what Twitter is trying to do, which is to try and become, um, you know, a super app sort of uh, platform, uh, is trying to make that transition, and that transition can only be made uh, because of the people uh, involved in it. Now, um, so so what I point out in my book is that in 2010, uh, um, you know, uh, Facebook didn't make the transition to mobile very well, and then in 20. Uh, 2022, it is not making the transition into short videos um, and um, you know the the empowerment of mobile even better. But the TikToks of the world are going to have um, their own problems, and the lifespan of a TikTok might be shorter than the lifespan of a Facebook uh, because we now have uh, virtual reality, uh, we have 3D, uh, and so on that has to exist either on the mobile device, uh, or uh, we have also got the new transition to IOTs, which is uh, Internet of Things, um, which uh, TikTok needs, needs to survive. So these are transitions. That's why the, the book's title starts with the great transition. Um, you know, and then uh, in that transition that's taking place that on the technology level, it affects every other industry that uh, operates on those technologies. So the banking industry, uh, had it has had it easy because all they, they thought they were doing was moving from branches to uh, platforms. And now what I'm saying is that it's already starting to move from platforms to personalization. Um, and the user of finance has got greater control uh, over his own data and over who he wants to relate to and how he wants to run his transactions. Uh, and that transition will intensify going, going forward. Now, what governments have done as a result of this transition is to try and curate it so that it will still be conducted by the traditional financial institutions that we know, the banks, right? Uh, and there are, you know, Larry Summers has been saying that, you know, the idea is that the banks should ace the, you know, the, the, the uh, decentralized finance uh, revolution uh, and, and bring it back into banking. Um, the banks can do that in one way. So one of the suggestions I have in my book, for example, is that, um, you know, instead of uh, instead of uh, selling bank uh, deposits, uh, banks every bank in the world uh, should start its own stablecoin, right? Um, and that enables the bank uh, to allow its users uh, uh, to to have access 
to a whole dimension of uh, digital platforms, digital ecosystems out there. Uh, and, and the stable coins are a lot more useful. And it's a nice transition from bank deposits to, to stable coins. Um, see, so, so I'm actually trying to plot how these transitions can or will work out going into going in, going into the for, uh, going into the future. Uh, so these are some of the ideas that I that I have in my book that I that I'm um, you know that I try to um, provide the the first principles in my book. Um, you know, just just remember this one thing, eh? like Kodak didn't make the transition very well, right? So um, you know, in 1996, 1995, 96, Kodak was one of the original um, inventors of the digital film. But right up to into the 2000s, uh, it was selling its 35 mm uh, physical film around the world. Everywhere in the world you put, you see, you, you go to a holiday in Mexico, you, you would see Kodak film, you know, waiting for you there and you can buy it easily and so on. And that was a physical product that they so loved uh, and they found it difficult to give it up. And, and by the time that Sony came out with its uh, mobile or rather its uh, camera, digital camera, and then iPhone came up in 2007, uh, it just led to the, um, you know, the, to the attrition of, of Kodak right up to the point that they became, they, they were bankrupted in 2010. Um, you know, so when I say to banks that, you know, uh, falling in love with your traditional bank deposit product, uh, you know, it's a certain way to be, make you irrelevant in the near future. Banks don't believe that, um, you know, they, because that's, that's what they know how to do. Um, you know, so, so these are some of the, um, you know, the, the revolutionary thinking that you need to have in mind um, by standing away from the uh, evolution that's taking place and then looking at it for what it is uh, and then validating the things that can and will work and the things that will not. Absolutely. I mean, you made some very interesting points and, and uh, some great points, honestly. And, you know, while you were just discussing, you know, the de uh, decentralized finance and and the, the evolution from platforms to personalization, it sounds very similar to uh, how it, it sounds like even though we're evolving and even though the banking industry and the financial industry and the technology industry is evolving, it 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 has a similar vibe to a primitive time when people had to do business with each other and trade off of like the barter system. And that's what it reminds me of. People are now uh, taking the control in their hands and they decide how they want to uh, have these transactions happen and how, how they, who they want to bank with, where they, wh how they want to hold their money. And, um, so I just think that's a really interesting correlation because it seems like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Wesley, you've got it. You've, you've nailed it on the head just there. So the other thing that I do in my book, and it's in the, in the middle of the book, I actually discuss how society uh, prefers to be organized in a sustainable way. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, finance uh, is best when it carries what society wants to once in order to hold it together, okay? But, so let me give you a couple of examples just to, um, you know, uh, take stock of what you just said. Um, uh, you know, during the COVID crisis, many countries on the lockdown, in some countries, um, even where there is good, um, you know, fiat currencies, like in Kenya, for example, I came across uh, something called Safaru Credit, which is um, um, a close community uh, of a, in a poor village, uh, where people give uh, coupons to each other for work done, and then they can use the coupon. and And the village has got a high uh, unemployment rate, uh, and uh, and then they use the coupons to go out and buy coffee and stuff like that, right? So, so you're actually giving a token um, uh, for some work done, um, and that token today can be, in fact, Safaru Credit is thinking about putting that on a blockchain uh, and digitizing it so that you know people can share that on on mobile device and so on. Uh, in the Philippines. Um, uh, play to earn game gaming uh, just you know took off because entire villages were locked down, so the entire families would end up playing to earn uh, and then turning that uh, into real money and going out to the uh, you know to the wet market to buy their food. Uh, you know, so, and, and this is real. I mean, it's not, um, you know, it, it's a new real economy, which is, um, you know, play to earn. Um, now, somebody who 
uh, is a purist will say, oh, play to earn is just gaming. You know, that's not real work. Uh, but that's the world we're entering today where value is being created uh, in a digital form, but it's uh, designed to capture how communities are organized in the in the physical form. Um, you know, and, and in Bangladesh, for example, uh, there was there there was uh, and there still is Grameen Bank, which is uh, you know microfinance uh, lending to small groups of six women uh, and who's who you know use the money borrowed uh, to go and buy something like a bicycle in order to be able to sell fresh vegetables to the next village and so on. Now, when that same model was transferred to another community in India, uh, where it was funded by venture capitalists uh, and it wasn't the money wasn't lent to uh, small, stable communities of women in villages, but to men looking for jobs in the city. They were transient workers. It just didn't work uh, because transient workers are, are unstable by nature uh, and uh, creating a microfinance ecosystem, um, you know, uh, um, made it very difficult for them to pay back on time. Um, there was a lot of misuse of, uh, you know, of the lending and so on. And, and the structure, uh, that credit structure wasn't able to hold. Um, you know, and putting it on technology made it even worse because uh, there were several uh, VC funded and VC meaning uh, Indians from the US going back to India and trying to, you know, thinking that they could put it on a platform and industrialize microfinance. It just collapsed. Uh, and there were suicides. Um, you know, there was a state called Andhra Pradesh that that decided to ban microfinance as a result and so on. So what you've said, which is, uh, we can only take into the digital era uh, what holds together to be true uh, in the social dimension. Um, you know, so we need to see what actually works in the social dimension and, and what are the criteria that we need to pay attention to and then carry it into the, into the digital dimension. Absolutely. I mean, you, you just hit a lot of great points here, um, you know, just as far as the play to earn um, new economy that's going on. And I feel like that's the new currency for today and the new currency of the day, which is information and attention. So like, if you can get attention, if you can get eyes on something, then that is that in itself is a form of currency. And then information uh, is a form of currency, which is something we'll, I'll, I'll get into later with you. But I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask this question and, and get your thoughts on it. You mentioned that you think it would be a great idea for banks to get involved by creating their own stable coins, which I, I think is a great idea as well. I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. But the the thing that um, people, I guess, may have some reservations about is us converting into like a, a global currency, like one currency for the entire world that maybe the government will control um, or, or have oversight of, and then, you know, they can determine um, if they can turn the, the well off a little bit easier if it's, if it's one global currency. So I wanted to ask, what were your thoughts on just that, that type of outcome or that type of event? Yeah, so you're talking about something called um, central bank digital currencies. Uh, and um, China, well, it wasn't China, it was actually Uruguay. Uh, and I'm going there um, later this month to, to talk to the central bank in Uruguay, why they experimented with a central bank digital currency, I think way back in 2017 or so. Uh, and, then, and then after one year, they, they quietly declared it a, a, a success uh, and then they forgot all about it. And then we only heard about it again when China was um, you know, promoting it. China started thinking about a central bank digital currency in 2014 uh, and then uh, put everything in place and then announced it in 2017, 2018. Um, now, the, so here the battle is between state uh, and private enterprise. Okay, and the individual. These are the three uh, pillars of society uh, that are at odds with each other and are tension with each other. So the state thinks that um, it can take digital, um, the digital economy uh, and, and digitize money uh, and still have control over it. Um, I'm just totally flabbergasted how uh, the state and the central banks in many countries uh, think that they can do this. 
uh, I happen to think that central bank digital currencies will eventually fail. And they will fail uh, because of a number of reasons. Firstly, um, the central banks I have no understanding or no appreciation. They have an understanding. Definitely, they have a very strong understanding, but not no, no appreciation of the amount of energy that's going into cryptocurrency. Okay, when you take any cryptocurrency, I mean, yeah, sure, FTT and FTX was a was a bad show, but you have Tezos, you've got Solana, you've got um, you know, you've got a whole range of cryptocurrencies, all created for specific pay purposes, and this is something that we need to come to terms with, you can create your own cryptocurrency. I can create my own cryptocurrency here in my you know, room. I can just um, program it and it becomes a cryptocurrency. Um, and what's the difference between yours or mine? It's you know, what utility that you put into the cryptocurrency and whether others will accept the cryptocurrency that you create. Uh, and so when uh, FTX when put out its own cryptocurrency, I think it surprised itself that um, that 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 was it, that it had the level of acceptance that it did. It 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 actually started uh, the FTT cryptocurrency at a certain price, uh, and the market accepted it and and took it on to a whole new level. Uh, and then FTX um, and Sam Bankman tried um, you know um, leveraged it and and then got into even more bigger trouble as a result. Um, you know, and, and the other thing that central banks are not uh, cognizant of is the amount of programming power that is being created around cryptos. So Solana, for example, has 300,000 programmers around the world trying to work, you know, products out of it, uh, you know, utilities and so on. You know, now central bank digital currencies um, as a form of token uh, need to have that same level of acceptance for it to take a life of its own. And central banks um, don't understand that, uh, you know, that they, they don't have the kind of attraction that uh, cryptos have today. Uh, of a million cryptos, maybe 10% will be successful uh, and 90% will be failures, or maybe 70% will be failures and 20% will be uh, specific use cryptos. In other words, they will not have a value, but they are important for specific users going forward, right? Um, now, the other thing that central banks don't understand is that, or don't appreciate, I, they understand this, that the distrust in many societies of the state um, just would not allow them to carry this. Uh, in Canada, for example, uh, Canada has some advanced um, central bank digital currency projects underway, but Canada is also the country where the government shut down the, uh, closed the bank accounts of the truckers when there was a revolt two years ago. You know, wow. so it's like the truckers are not ever going to trust the system where you're going to create money that you can switch off for me when you like it. Right. So, so there's this huge disconnect between what central bankers are thinking and what the man on the ground is thinking. And here in the U.S., um, Janet Yellen put out this paper, you know, that the U.S. should also have. So because I'm from the industry, uh, I know that when central bankers get together, whether it's Janet Yellen or the Central Bank of Japan or China, they meet together at, in Basel. Okay, there's, there's something called the Bank for International Settlements. They meet there every year. Uh, and they have a love fest, okay? They love what each other is doing. Uh, and they fall over themselves trying to outdo each other in uh, any shared idea that they have. And I've seen several other shared ideas they've had before. There, there's something called um, inflation targeting, which every central bank in the world subscribes to today. And it started with New Zealand. And today, even the US has some form of uh, inflation targeting, which is the idea is that um, the central bank describes its own job as being, I, my job is to make sure that the interest margin uh, for the country doesn't go beyond a certain band. Uh, and within that band, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing right. So, so as long as inflation doesn't go 2% up or below um, the current rates, uh, he's done his job, right? So, so um, central banks have themes that they, that they work on and they share with each other and they love what they're doing. But the reality on the ground is uh, to give life to any new technology, especially in payments, um, you have to jumpstart it. Um, you know, like for example, in, in China, when, and both uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, with Amazon and uh, um, and and um, um, you know um, Alibaba, um, the the founder uh, had 
I, I'm sorry, I'm very bad with names right now. It must be a lack of coffee. But, uh, um, you know, uh, Jack Ma, um, they, they both said the same thing, that in the early days of starting their platforms, they have to uh, practically fabricate the first few transactions. They have to market it. You know, Alibaba actually bought uh, goods online from their own customers and stored it away in a warehouse uh, to give the impression that uh, the, the platform was working. Uh, you know, and Jeff Bezos had to do his own version of that. So in, nothing happens uh, just because the central banker says it, will, it should happen. Uh, it always happens because large businesses throw a lot of marketing money uh, into kick-starting a new uh, revolution. You know, and, and funnily enough, mm -hmm. Uh, we like to think of banks today as being uh, highly innovative. Uh, they actually aren't. They, they are usually the last to make a change because every change they make takes business away from them. Uh, you know, and in payments, for example, uh, uh, payments was always very profitable for the banks because the slower it was, uh, they were able to sit on a lot of float. They call it float um, and make money on the interest over a three-day period. And that's why checks took three to five days to travel from one person to the other in the old days. Today, with Fed, uh, Fed now coming on stream next year, um, you and I can send money to each other instantly. And that takes the float away from the banks. And the banks don't like it. They, they, they resist that as long as they can. Okay, So, um, so this thing about central bank digital currency, uh, I've just cut short to from the idea of what is it to how it will work out. Um, I think that, uh, yes, uh, around the world, even in China, there is a distrust uh, of the state um, having control uh, over the token that, that I uh, and who I want to relate to. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and yet uh, many states in the world are going about it as if uh, nothing is going to stop them. Uh, and I don't think that's going to work out. And the, the, third thing that the, and the third thing that states don't appreciate is this. Technology moves incredibly quickly. So the blockchain technology that we are familiar with is going to look very different uh, when we put in um, you know, new, new, new technologies like uh, um, you know, digital, digitizing that even further, right? So, so um, uh, quantum, uh, quantum comp computing is going to make block, going to give life to blockchain in a way that um, that that we would not, they were going to see new things that we're not seeing today. Um, you know, it's it's in the same way that the automobile when it first started here in New York um, in 1902, 1903, um, it was a nuisance. Cars were heavy, they were slow, they were noisy, uh, they were polluting, uh, and they upset the horses. Uh, and so all the rules in New York, okay. Uh, in 1902 to 19, uh, up to about 1910, uh, were against the automobile, the, the, the motor vehicle, because it was just too cumbersome. Uh, it was more like a status symbol, or a toy for the rich, while everybody was out on their horse carriages. Uh, and then it became quieter, faster, um, you know, more comfortable, um, and didn't damage the roads. Uh, and then all those rules started to look, um, you know, uh, unnecessary over time. So I think that's exactly what's going to happen uh, as quantum, uh, quantum, quantum computing puts even more energy into a lot of the network effects that we have today. Absolutely. I mean, and, and these are some, I mean, just extremely interesting and in-depth and, and insightful, um, you know, insightful ideologies that you're sharing with us right now and, and, and predictions on the future and what what gave you this interest what gave you your interest into want want to try to um just theorize on the future and 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 think about the the future of banking and finance and where we'll go like what gave you that initial spark to just say hey i want to have a voice in this space and in this market you know i've been uh i I launched the Asian Banker uh, in 1996, uh, and in that period, I mean, it's a life. It was a livelihood for me. It started as a publication, and then we built the uh, research part of the business. And when we did the research and consulting part of the business, I was going into banks, putting up PowerPoint slides to tell them what they already knew, right? And and uh, and corporate life is such that uh, you know the the senior bankers always hire consultants to tell them 
what they already know, okay, uh, to make themselves feel better. So I was actually doing this like, you know, uh, Mr. Banker, this is what, you are a great bank, this is what you have, uh, and this is what you're going to do with it. And then after a few years, you start thinking, wait a minute, I'm actually stating the obvious. I'm not making any difference, right? Difference to, to this person. And, and, and I'm, I'm not even taking a bet on uh, where this industry is evolving. Uh, you know, and then comes, um, you know, uh, blockchain, uh, crypto, uh, you know, uh, 2008, um, you know, with Bitcoin and so on. Um, and at first it's uh, incredibly disturbing. Um, you know, and and uh, and it's very easy to uh, write it off and, and just say, you know, well, this is just a fad or something like that. Um, then you see the take up, uh, which is that an entire segment of society today is giving value to something that is ephemeral, meaning that it doesn't exist. It's digital um, and it doesn't even have a utility. It doesn't have a value. And yet, why are we treating it like gold? And then we stop and we think, oh, gold also doesn't have a value, which is it's you know practically useless for most things except for a few um, you know electrical stuff that for which you gold is useful uh, to conduct um, you know um, to, to to transmit and to to use as a, a technology, right? So other than that, uh, there's nothing there that that is that gives gold any inherent value. Then you realize, and this comes from traveling basically. Um, that the reason uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the British came to um, Central America um, in the 1700s and 1600s, uh, 1500s and then 1600s and 1700s, because they imagined there was gold here. There was also fiction, right? And, um, and then they imagined that there were uh, things that they needed to achieve and they and they created stories around what they wanted to achieve and then achieve them and then made them into realities. And the final reality of what America eventually became was not at all the reality on which it was sold to, um, you know, King, Prince Philip or King Philip, Philip or Isabella of, of Spain, uh, you know, but, but uh, uh, or the fact that you, this was the route back to China, you know, that's the other thing that they thought it was. Um, and, and they thought they actually landed in China. So what I'm trying to say here is this, that if you want to be useful uh, in helping businesses chart their future, you need to understand how fiction and reality intermingle to create the future that we are building. Wow. Now, so everything that I've just told you or we shared and we, we discussed today uh, has to have a practical application. And the practical application is if you're an entrepreneur uh, and you want to start a business, um, you know, a, a, a technology business or a fintech startup in, in finance, in banking, there's something called fintech these days. Uh, and there are many fintech players. They want to revolutionize payments and so on. Uh, having these ideas in your mind will help you to know what's going to work and what will not work. If you take the view that the platform economy is now transitioning to personalization, then you would not take the same approach as uh, Jeff Bezos did uh, when he was building Amazon in the early days. Uh, you will start thinking about, okay, how, how do I make money by not being an intermediary? Uh, what can my role be when individuals actually transact with each other? So your business model, uh, you not need to start thinking about how different your business model will be. Um, and you can only do that if you're not in love with um, you know, what people are already doing. Absolutely. And that was, I, I think that's a very important concept to understand and to grasp if you're trying to create a new business or create a, not a new business, but create a, a company, something that is of the future and something that will be valuable in the future. Because that's something that I realized like today, now, and it's, and it's even already changing, but I'll say a few years ago that intermediary business was the best business to be in so for amazon or for uber or for airbnb so like you know airbnb doesn't really they don't own any of the properties but they just are that middleman so the people that own it they can connect that with the people that want to use it but what you're saying is the thing of the future is to just focus on how do you create that personalization first instead of being the intermediary yeah in fact I, in my book i the 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 picture in my book cover is that of an ice cube 
right? And I remind people that, I remind the reader that ice was something you sawed out of the lakes in Michigan and in Boston, and you put it on, on horse carriages, horse, horse carriage carts, and you, and you transport them all the way to New York, put them on ships. Can you imagine how uh, inefficient it, that would have been, that was in right. its time? Uh, you know, and what is ice today? It's something that you and I produce in the refrigerator, right? Yeah. So, uh, and it, there was a time inter, in the intermediary of that process was that refrigerators were something that large businesses uh, dominated. So there was the ice merchant uh, that built these huge refrigerators and then sold ice to the local community. So, so society moved from uh, having absolutely no control to having some institutional control to personalizing ice, right? And wow. so that's what I'm saying that, uh, today, when you think about the value of money, uh, we think that there's, we have no control at all on inflation, on bank charges, on, on floats, uh, you know, and, and so on, and on the technology itself um, that takes a, a long time before money actually reaches you. Um, but then one day when we are able to generate our own token, and the token has value because the person we are giving to uh, is willing to recognize that value, then the institutions have to reconfigure uh, the role that they play in that in that transition, you know. And the thing is this: that I really hope that the ideas that I have has got uh, current, uh, um, you know, value, current use, uh, because um, in building businesses, uh, you have to start with what works today. Uh, what's interesting in a lot of startup businesses is that uh, they are expecting not to make money. Uh, that that they have to be funded by venture capital for a long time, and and actually the real value is created when venture capital when venture capitalists sell um, their their stocks to another venture cap. It's it's actually a form of um, you know it's it's a form of uh, of a Ponzi scheme where, uh, where even when a business is not proven itself, uh, the 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 investor is made his money because he sold it to another investor, um, and the valuation goes up. In fact, going back to the story of FTX, um, the, the judgment shouldn't be on uh, Sam uh, bankman uh, you know, not, not on SPF, but on the investors. What in the world were they looking at? What in the world did they think existed there? Uh, you know, they are the ones who, uh, you know, uh, provided the funding that, and then which was leveraged up to forty billion dollars. Um, you know, when when uh, when uh, FTX and FTT were no different from anything else that exists in the marketplace. So they created a fiction out of that. Um, you know, and then what were they looking at? Were they looking at a smart kid? Um, you know, and if you were looking at a smart kid, you know, uh, what valuation would you give that kid? Um, you know, and stuff like that. So I think that uh, the error in uh, in identifying uh, and funding uh, new ideas uh, exists on both sides of the equation, which is the supply side, the, the, the founders, the entrepreneurs, but it also uh, needs to, uh, there needs to be a judgment on the investors. What did they think they were looking at? You know, that part of the story is not being discussed very well today. Uh, and if we have a very clear idea, or it may does not even need to be an accurate idea. Uh, it's just a working idea of where we think this technology is going. Then we will be able to value it more appropriately and, and carry it along. And, and the wastage in capital um, that is involved uh, and, and the heartache, um, you know, uh, is, we, we can reduce that as much as possible and, and therefore be successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in how do you define success as a founder, an author, and a financial thought leader? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Today, of course, I'm a little bit more philosophical because uh, as an entrepreneur, if you ask me uh, where I failed most of all uh, and where did I, where was I given a hundred chances and I, I, I flipped them so badly several times until I started getting them right, uh, I'll say it's not the money, it's the people. Okay, especially the people who work for you, who give you loyalty, um, who who believe your dreams, uh, and then you work them to death, and then you you uh, you extract uh, their energies, uh, and uh, and then when you are you know uh, struggling with ideas or or even revenue, um, you know you you make it very difficult on your people. Um, the the 
it is incumbent on any entrepreneur uh, to also be a teacher and also be uh, a motivator. It's it comes with a job. You cannot um, you cannot uh, um, you know you, you cannot um, not take on this responsibility. Um, you know, and so the first gift given to you is never the money it's the people that you work with uh and there are people in my own organization where um where i've said this before uh if someone gave me a million dollars and someone gave me this stuff uh, i would be a fool to accept the million dollars uh, because with this stuff i can grow uh, teams i can i can grow clients and stuff uh with a million dollars um you know i would still need to look for the people uh, you know, so um, so I think that over time uh, I've mellowed a lot, um, and uh, and whenever I'm about to err on the side of people, for example, I meet someone new and I say, "Oh, this person is exciting. Uh, you know, like he can change my business." I always go back with, um, you know, let him prove himself and earn the respect of the people who are already with me, uh, and then um, and then let him uh, find his own. Uh, validation from the team that I have, uh, because you may have money, but the real thing you have is people. And if you and one of the things is that uh, uh, if your people are loyal, um, you can do something with it. You've got you've got raw material with which you can work with. Uh, of course, you need to pick people who are already sufficiently competent for what they're doing. If if it is not their job, if it's not their thing, uh, let them go, of course, you know, then find people who have the, the entry level. And then the rest of it, the entrepreneur's job uh, is to scale that. Um, now, why I also say that is because uh, I think many entrepreneurs uh, wish that if I pay you, why can't you do this? You know, like if I pay you, you know, you should be able to solve my problem for me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, building business is not that way. Uh, you know, it's it's about uh, how do we uh, take on this journey together. Um, you know, so so if you value money, if you know how to tear a million dollars and throw it away, uh, think of people that same way. Um, you know, um, and I think that you're able to scale. Today, I'm able to travel widely because I've got great people. Uh, you know, and and they worry about things that they're supposed to worry, and and then uh, uh, and actually, my traveling part of it has to do with leaving them alone to work i mean if you've got somebody worrying about something you don't need two people to worry about it then i have to refine define myself uh right. you know so so i need to uh, challenge myself to improve right. myself so that the organization can grow and and my own people can figure out what they want to do uh you know i think i think uh in a nutshell i think that's the big thing that is on my mind right now i mean i'm sure there are other things as well um, you know, and right now, in order to grow the business further, um, because of the nature of the financialization of the world, uh, all businesses need more funding than they have. Organic growth is no longer possible. So I'm actually um, looking at uh, inviting other investors and so on. Uh, but uh, and that's another journey by itself. Uh, but you start with the people you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all great. Uh, all great value and, and great wisdom and, and things that we can we can actively implement today and right now um what impact do you hope that your books and your your thoughts and ideas have on the world as a whole you know um after running businesses i've always wanted to write my book in fact this first book probably took about 10 years in the making and and part of the reason for the for the time it took had to do with me uh, refining my own thinking. I am naturally a writer. I you know I, I started writing when I was nine years old. Uh, of all the jobs that I've had, if you look at what was common among them, it was writing. Um, but to write my first book, I needed to um, you know I needed to uh, crystallize my own. Uh, existence, um, you know, like give meaning to all the experiences that I've had, and then uh, uh, you know let the book be an outlet for for you know what uh, you need to, to synthesize inside yourself. Now, after having written the first book, the second book becomes easier, and the third, I'm sure that eventually, um, you know. And the funny thing is, I I noticed that all great writers 
um, and, and painters and any, anyone with an artistic skill, there is usually a 10 year period of their most uh, profound um, you know, uh, contributions, their, their most profound works. It's a, it's a 10 year intensive period. Um, and writing is a, um, it's a cathartic um, you know, venture. It, 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 the first person is changes is the writer himself because you are processing thinking and you are refining them until you can crystallize an idea. And, and you're the first person to be hit with, you know, like what it means, uh, you know. So um, the thing is that, so it's, it's, um, it's um, you know, it's changing me uh, and, um, and by being uh, plugged into society, uh, I hope that it has an effect of its own. Um, you know, the, the one interesting thing about good writing is that it doesn't say everything. The person reading what needs to be written uh, will read his own ideas as he's reading it. Um, now, as a, if as a writer, you are able to use the fewest number of words in the simplest number of words, and you capture an idea, and then you, you trigger the imagination of your reader, that's a great writer, okay? Um, and sometimes when I'm writing, a, reading a good book, a, a good fiction book, for example, I'm smiling as I'm reading it because I'm able to relate. I'm able to throw in my own stories of, of the story that I'm reading. Uh, you know, so, so I think that, um, so th this, I'm in that phase right now where my best contribution to society uh, is to write. Uh, and that's also because I've spent, you know, 30 years of my life uh, running businesses. So when I write, I have the, the economy of words, um, you know, and the desire to be useful. Uh, because in business, if you're not making money, you're going to be hungry. So, you know, you kind of can't be a dreamer for being a dreamer's sake. Uh, and I hope that that's reflected in my books as well. Absolutely. I mean, you said something very interesting that, that caught my ear when you, you mentioned that you've, you've recognized the pattern of there's a 10 year span for an artist or a creative in, in in correlation to when they their most profound work, would you mind like kind of going in, into that a little bit more, like what what you meant when you said that? I mean, you take anyone, Vincent Van Gogh, um, you know, you, you uh, the writers that I like very much, Nadine Gunaima, um, you know, um, Love in the Name of Time of Cholera, I, Cholera, um, the South American writer. Uh, all of them had ten years of intensive um, output. Um, you know, and sometimes they die at the end of the 10 years uh, and sometimes they just fade away. Uh, but um, entering the 10 years comes from a life of uh, experiences and then you draw from that. Uh, and then in that 10 years, you are intensive in terms of output and you're able to be rich in your output because you've suffered it. You know, Vincent Van Gogh suffered, um, um, you know, madness and so on. Um, and it was growing in him. And in the 10 years of his, um, of his uh, paintings, uh, he captured something that was never captured before. So, you know, so it, it is a combination of your personal life experiences and where you are in your own life at that point in time. Uh, you know, and some, for some people, the 10 years comes when they are between 20 and 30. Uh, and after they're 30, they actually spent. In other words, they've, they've seen the peak of their uh, life. Uh, and some people is 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and then, and so on. So I'm at the point where I, I have the energy to travel. Um, uh, I, and I can consciously say that I don't run my business uh, directly. Um, uh, I put, you know, that, that I have people I'm grateful for. Uh, and therefore, it releases me to, uh, to start on this journey of my 10 years. You know, actually, I, I must say this to you that you're doing we're doing this interview on my birthday, by the way. <laughs> oh, wow, man. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. This is awesome. I'm glad I get to share this moment with you. And I'm glad I'm able to say the things I'm saying to you. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you mentioned that you're you're in this stage in life where you you put in your 30 years and of of business experience and banking experience and just life experience. So how do you see the next 30 years playing out or maybe not even 30 years, but the next five years playing out for you? My next 10 years, definitely writing. Um, next eight years, um, com you know, the thing is that this thing that I've, since I've done a hundred and something countries, right? 
um, eight, I think I, I forget now, but um, you know that that hey, the other uh, there's 195 official countries in in the uh, in the United Nations, and then there are ter territories and so on. I said, okay, I can do the other 85, uh, you know, and then I'm thinking, well, that's not a goal in itself because it's very hard to do, uh, at, you know, 10, 12 countries a year. Uh, in, in a meaningful way that is go in there and spend time and, and so on. Um, and there's no, uh, and it's a profanity to, to say, I want to do 185, 195 countries, uh, meaning that there's no value in itself. Okay. That, because uh, if all you did was 195 countries, you would not even remember which bed you slept in last night, um, you know, which doesn't help uh, anything about what you're learning and stuff like that. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, uh, in, in a goal in itself. It's like, so as I'm doing that, what is it that I'm learning, um, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, I do not have children. So um, I, um, and, and I have several God children and I enjoy the, the, uh, the, the life I have with them, which is and to be part of their life, watching them grow up and stuff. Um, you know, it, now what I'm saying, why I say this is because um, um, when you have children, it sounds like, um, you know, you have something to live for, which is, you know, to, to motivate, uh, you know, the, 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 the people that you've brought into the world. Uh, but when you don't have children and when, you're, when, you're, when you are free to be uh, relevant to people in the way that you want to, uh, then you have to consciously make that choice. Um, you know, so uh, I'd say this, that my family, of course, is important to me. Uh, my the people who work for me, especially those who have been with me for many years, are important to me, and and I have to be ambitious so that I can help them grow uh, and give them uh, uh, you know something that they can look forward to. So um, so so that gives me purpose. Uh, and then uh, by traveling uh, and writing, uh, I'm crystallizing ideas that make sense to people. Um, you know, so um, um, and that will um, you know take care. Uh, of the foreseeable future, uh, I have no problems with uh, being killed in a you know in a plane crash uh, tomorrow. Um, you know, and neither have I a problem growing old. The only thing I ask for uh, is that I'm, I remain healthy. Uh, this is health. I think is uh, you know a thousand times more important than anything else. Uh, so if I you know I I just totally enjoyed the way that um, the Queen of England, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth passed on. Uh, she just gave up a seat spirit. Uh, you know, two days before she was seeing the new prime minister and the two days later she, she decided, you know what, I'm, I'm done, I'm tired. Uh, there was no word about any illness or anything of that sort. Um, so if, that, if you have that sort of life and, and she lived the purpose of her life right up to the last day, uh, you know, now that's a, a grand way to go. Uh, you know, but I don't, well, we all have our own thing, which, you know, maybe illness and stuff like that. So, and of course, not to be a burden to anybody. Um, I think if, if we can meet some of these requirements, I don't know how universal what I'm saying is, um, you know, because I come with Asian values and, uh, um, you know, and, and we have societies which are a lot more, um, you know, coherent because, um, um, you know, the U.S. is a very difficult country uh, because it's the frontier uh, of the information revolution, um, you know, and um, all, everything that needs to be known about each other can be known. Uh, and therefore, we're dealing with, uh, you know, every individual in the U.S. is empowered with so much information uh, more than anyone else. Uh, what they do with that information is difficult. Uh, and, and this society is, uh, you know, finding its way from one uh, cathartic, um, you know, dysfunctionality to the next. But every other country in the world will go through the same problems that the U.S. is going through today. So, um, so even especially in the U.S., if we have people who can guide the thinking of everybody else, of as many people as possible, uh, that is a wonderful uh, career. Uh, a wonderful opportunity and a, and a wonderful responsibility uh, that uh, thinking people or thinkers can have in the U.S. Man, that's incredible. And, and I, I definitely think a lot of people will resonate with what you said. Um, you know, just how you feel, because we all want to be healthy. We all want to be happy and we all want to feel that we are contributing um, to what we care about it and doing what we love. 
But um, Emmanuel, Daniel, thank you so much today for your time. I mean, I've enjoyed getting a chance to just learn more about you and learn how you think. Uh, so this has been a huge honor for me. And uh, hopefully this isn't this isn't the last time we have you on the podcast. Hopefully you'll be you'll be uh, be able to be a guest again. But thank you so much for your time today. Leslie, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for asking the questions you have and and for giving me the you know the the pleasure of or the the opportunity to explain uh, more clearly thank you very much for that awesome